to it, and I, I did not only just, uh, I, I, but I heard it. And uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of Jonathan Kahn. How many of you know him? You ever read any of his stuff? Melanie has. But he is a, a Jew that had been born again, and he's a Christian now, and he's preaching the Word of God. Now, if you want to hear, if you want to hear the uh, things about history, and if you want to understand the festivals and all the things that Israel did, you just find a Jewish Christian, and uh, he can tell you all about it. He can really lay it out as to the customs of the Jewish people. And so I heard him uh, yesterday evening, heard him just a little bit this, uh, this evening, as he discussed, uh, he discussed uh, three names, and he discussed uh, three things concerning those names, and they all have to do with the nation of Israel. And so tonight, I, it's the uh, first part of the service, and I don't know, mate, I, I want to, if there's any questions, I want you to be, feel free to ask tonight. But we'll talk about this a little bit and see if we can learn from the things that, that he spoke of. And, and I did not just put down what he said. I tried to do a little research myself, but I was limited in time. But... Tonight, I want you to, those three names I want you to think about are Cyrus, that's in the Old Testament, and I want you to think about Harry Truman, who was one of our presidents, and I want you to think about Donald Trump. And I want you to think about a number I want you to think about the number 70. Now, the number 70 has something to do with sounding the trumpet, the Jubilee. And as you, as they sounded the trumpet, everything went back to its original owner. So remember that. So let's go back to before Cyrus's time. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to Second Chronicles. I turned there last Sunday and I read the prior verses. I didn't get to these verses. They didn't put in a part of the sermon. But in Second Chronicles, chapter 36, which is the last chapter. Now, I, I want you to see that uh, in, we'll pick up reading and showing that Israel is going to Babylon. Now, let's, let's pick up reading verse 16. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his word. Now this is talking about Israel. And misused his prophets uh, and until the wrath of the Lord rose against the, his people. Till there was no remedy. Till there was no remedy. So that means that God was going to park the children of Israel for 70 years. That's in Second Chronicles 16. Through 21. And so it's here. Chapter 36. Second Chronicles. Chapter 36. Got it? So here he's telling Israel. That he's going to send them. To Babylon. And how long is their stay going to be there? 70 years. So 70 years comes into play here. And, and so he goes on, and, uh, and, and he says, verse 17, Therefore he brought upon them the kings of the Chaldees, who slew their young men, and the sword, and sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon 
the young men or maidens, old men, or him that stooped for age, he gave them all into his hand. And all the, God gave them all into the hands of the ruler, which was Nebuchadnezzar, really, that took, that came from Babylon. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his prince, and all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God, and break down the walls of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the vessels, the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the king of Persia. Till the reign of the king of Persia. Now that's important to remember. To fulfill the words of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Unto the land had enjoyed her Sabbath for as long as she lay desolate. She kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. That's three scores is 60 years and ten years is 70 years. Though they were going to Babylon for 70 years. Now notice in verses 22 through and 23. God did not close the chapter without hope for the nation of Israel. He said now, and this is prophecy, now the first year of Cyrus, by the way, this is 70 years later. This writing here, is in, beginning in verses 22 and 23, is 70 years later. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and put it also in writing, say, Thus say, saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth, hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build a house in Jerusalem, which is in Ju Judah. Who is therefore among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him and let him go. Now here in 2 Chronicles 36, we see that God prophesied through Cyrus, or that Cyrus, the, first, the king of, of Persia, would make a decree that Israel would come back and build this temple. So then, if we, if we look here at that point, this was in B.C. 16, that they went into captivity. Now look over in, in the next page, and we will find the book of Ezra, the next page, following Second Chronicles. Now begin reading in verse 2, or chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now notice the date here, is 536. Now some time had passed. Now the dates that we have here are not all exact. But they're close. So then in chapter 1 of Ezra, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. He made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord of God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he hath charged me to build a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now we have this twice. So this, this is a sure thing. 
But there's something I want you to notice here too. He talked about their God. God was, uh, Jehovah God was not Cyrus's God. That was Israel's God. I'll show you a little bit more about that in just a moment. Now this is kind of spectacular here of this event taking place. But if you will go over with me into Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28. Now notice when Isaiah wrote this. It was in 712 B.C. The proclamation here between to, to Ezra and the last part of Chronicles. Well, in Chronicles it was 610 and in Ezra, it was 536. But look what God told Isaiah long before Ezra. Long before the writing of, of, of Chronicles here. But in Isaiah in 7 to, Now remember, B.C. is the top going down. It's not from zero going up, but it was from the number coming down. So in 712 B.C., verse 28 of Isaiah 44. Thus saith Osiris. Again we see Cyrus. He is my shepherd. And shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem. Thou shalt be built. And to the temple. And thy foundation shall be laid. Isaiah spoke of this. Long before Israel. Journeyed to Babylon. Isaiah prophesied this. Through the word of God. Many years earlier. But look what God called him. God called him my shepherd. Why? Because it was God who stirred his heart. He was not a saved man. But he's a man that God used. To fulfill the prophecy of God. He's a man that God used at the end of the 70 years. The trumpet sounded. The year of Jubilee, 70 years later. The year of Jubilee, the year of the trumpet. The trumpet sounded. And what did he say they would do? They'd go back to Jerusalem. The rightful place that they belonged. He was giving it back to them. For them to go there. And to live. But as we look in. Chapter 45. Of Isaiah. Beginning of verse 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed. He calls him anointed. When God says that I raise up kings and I put down kings, he said, I'll do what I want to do when it comes to my prophecy, and I will fulfill it the way that I want to fulfill it. He used Cyrus, a man that did not know God. He stirred his heart. He called him a shepherd. He called him the, uh, his anointed. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations. God said, I've given him power to defeat the nations that he's defeated, to be where he's at. Why? Because God's going to use him. God had, God had, he was a part of God's plan to subdue nations before him. 
And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two levied gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I'm not going to try to go into those, but I want you to just read a little bit more here. I will go therefore, I will go before thee, and make the crooked place straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut the sunder the bars of iron. In other words, he's saying to Cyrus, he said, I'll, move, I'll remove all the obstacles. You, you make the decree. You're my shepherd now, and you're my anointed. You are the one that I have appointed to do this. And I will give thee the treasures of the darkness and hidden treasures of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. You see that? That thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call me by thy name, I'm the God of Israel. He didn't say he was Cyrus' God. He said, I'm the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have given, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Get that? Thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me, and I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me, and I am the Lord, and there is none else. I formed the light, I created the darkness, I made peace and, cre and created and create evil. The Lord do all these things. Now I don't believe he created sin, but he created that that became evil. He created Lucifer who became evil. Drop down ye heavens. Come above and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation and let the righteous spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. And he goes on and talks about here, about Cyrus and God's decree through him. Now, let's think about this. We know that Cyrus is the first one. And we know that it was prophesied that, that Cyrus would be the year of Jubilee, the 70th year. The trumpet would sound, and he would give back Israel in the temple, back to the Israelites. And he helped them as they went back to their homeland. He did not serve the God of Israel but the God of Israel used him. So then we know that God uses people, doesn't he? And he used this man to fulfill his plan through the nation of Israel. Let's step forward in time to Harry Truman. Harry Truman, I read, was not supposed to be president, but he became president. I heard that Donald Trump was not supposed to be president, but he became president. Why? Why did Truman become president? Well, it was said and I don't know how all of this came about because they didn't have time to research it. But during the time of the Holocaust, when the Jews were being killed, that Roosevelt had the opportunity to release the Jews from trains going to their death. And Roosevelt refused to let them get off of the trains. 
That wasn't a, that wasn't a man that God was going to use to bring this all about. But in 1947, now Truman is president. Truman, who was a, a man who used religion in trying to defeat communism. Truman's mother was a devout Zionist. She loved Israel. Roosevelt loved to read about Israel, or not Roosevelt, Truman. So in 1947, Truman, the President of the United States, was the one who went to the UN and recommended that what had been established in 1947 during World War I, or 1917, during World War I, that uh, they wanted to give Israel a homeland. It was called the Balfour Act. But it wasn't until 1947 that Truman stepped forward and said, let's give Israel a homeland. And he promoted it. He pushed it. And it came about. Under Truman's time. And so we know that in 19... 1947, Israel was given then and promised a homeland. But it was not until 1948 that they actually went home and they became a nation. But everything took place in 1947 to prepare them for 1948, May the 14th, to become a nation. It was interesting that Harry Truman made this statement. When it was all said and done, in New York City, Sarah, uh, he said, Truman said, I am the Cyrus of the Bible. That's two Cyruses. There's a third one. He said, I am the Cyrus of the Bible. Then along came Donald Trump. You know what the word Donald means? World ruler. Who is the president of the United States and what is he labeled? The world's most powerful man. He wasn't supposed to win, was he? They didn't give him any kind of chance to win, but you know what? God had a plan. He won. Trump means trumpet. Means trumpet. Remember, what Truman did in 1947. Now you know what Donald Trump did in 2017. He declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel. Truman didn't do that. Truman just gave him a homeland. But in 2017... Donald Trump declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel and moved the American embassy to Jerusalem. Now do your math. 1947. 
2017, 70 years. Donald Trump was the trumpet man. Where did, when Israel went into captivity, where did they leave from? And went to Babylon. They left Jerusalem. That was their, that was their capital. That belonged to them. In the year of the trumpets, what did Donald Trump give it to? He gave it back to them. It's interesting that Donald Trump had been reading and studying about Cyrus. Cyrus of the Old Testament. Did you know this? Trump was born the year that Truman sounded the trumpet in 1947. That was the year that Donald Trump was born. Donald Trump was 70 years old when all this took place. Isn't it amazing? What does that mean? It means that God uses people the way he wants to use them. The Cyrus Act, number one, of sending Israel back home in the Old Testament to rebuild the temple and to restore the word of God and to build the walls and the gates. That was a Cyrus Act. In 1947, they were given a homeland, a place that they could call their own for the first time in many, many years. That was a Cyrus act. And when Trump made Jerusalem their capital, he gave them back Jerusalem which was a Cyrus act that's amazing isn't it when you start putting all of that together I, I believe that you can take this and say that, it, that it, it wasn't the people that put Donald Trump in it was God himself that put Donald Trump in to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish How many of you believe that Hillary Clinton would have done that? And we're not using politics. But Bill Clinton, George Bush Sr., George Bush Jr., Obama, they all promise that they would make Israel, or make Jerusalem the capital, move the embassy there, but not one of them did. But God found a man that would. And he knew it. He was stirred. He stirred his heart. So I, I don't know whether you, you, you understand or, or, or do, you, do you understand the importance of of, of how that we recognize that God is in control. He's in control of things. And I think I, I think that the that the next president is going to be determining wh what God is going to do with this country and with the world. Well, God won't put in somebody that he wants to accomplish something for his glory and, and for his people 
Or will he just put somebody in and, and take his hand off of us and say, they're yours now. Talking about the country, not talking about God's people. You see, that's why today we must have a faith that does not waver. A faith in Christ that is not a wavering faith. With those things in mind, I want to talk about our faith for just a few moments. In Hebrews chapter 10, I want you to read verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. You know what he's saying there? He's saying no matter what comes upon us and no matter what we're in the midst of, don't let our faith bend. Don't let it bend in the wind. But let us remain faithful and true to him. That we have professed him to be, to be the Lord of our life. So let us do it without bending. Let's, let us do it standing straight and, and tall and strong. Believing that if our God can put together something that happened that many years ago and had had control and order until the point where we're at now, surely he's a God that can take care of us now. Man could not have put together what God put together with the three Cyruses. Only God could do that. Man cannot help us to keep our faith from bending. The only one who can help us and keep our faith from bending is our trust in Christ. Look in Romans 4, 18. I meant to ask, did anybody have any questions about what we were talking about a while ago, about the Cyruses? Any, any questions? I don't know that I could answer them, but I'll go home and do some more homework. I, I'll admit to you that I have not done a whole lot of homework in this. I, I just kind of put it together uh, last night and this evening. But has anybody got any question concerning it? And if you get any, you, you bring them back to me. If, if he becomes president in 2020, I believe you're right. I believe it'll be because God is behind him. And, wh and what would that mean to us? That would mean that God has given us a little more time. So then what are we going to do with the time? Are we going to seclude ourselves? Are we going to become quiet? God's not going to give us more time to be silent. God's not going to give us more time to appease our fears. God's going to give us more time because he believes that we have strength in him and we're going to try to do Something to help the people. To help build. The family of God. But I believe I said Romans 4.18. Listen to what he said. Who against hope. Believing in hope. That he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. Through 21, and being not weak in faith, in the verse 19, 
he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Talking about Abraham and Sarah, he staggered not. He stayed with God. I wonder how many of us would, at a hundred years old, would believe that we could still father a child. I wonder how many of you women at, at 80 years old believed you could still father or mother a, a child. He said his faith didn't stagger. He's trying to say to us, don't let your faith stagger because there's not anything my God cannot do. Not anything that he cannot do. And help those that are faithful in him. Don't stumble in this hour. Don't stumble. Don't bend. Don't stagger. But be strong. James chapter 1 verse 6. He said, Let not, don't have a faith that doubts. In James 1 6. Don't doubt God. Don't doubt that he'll take care of you. Don't doubt. Don't doubt him because he is in full control. Don't doubt him. There's not going to be a hair to fall off your head that he don't know about it. There won't be a spiral that falls that he don't know about it. So don't, don't doubt him. He sees what's going on in our life. He knows what's going on in our life. He brings us through the difficult times. He's bringing me through times that I, I just didn't know whether I could make it or not. There's been times in the last three or four years that, that I, I didn't know what the, what the next day was going to be like. Let me be honest with you. But I said, God, I'm not going to quit on you. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to doubt that you're going to take care of me. And you'll give me what I need to stand behind this pulpit to preach. There have been times I've had to hold on to it. Because I, was, I felt so weak. There's been times that. That I didn't know whether I would be able to even stand here. But God provided. Now what would have happened? I'll just give you an example. The times that I had to hold on here because I was lightheaded. What would have happened if I had just went and sat down and said, well, somebody else is going to have to take over. I would have doubted that God was able to do through me what he'd give me in preaching and the message that he'd give me for that day. You see, I, I just believe that we need to have that strong, strong faith in him that never doubts what he can do. Somebody asked me a little while ago, said, Preacher said, I believe it all and this is going to happen. said, what can we do? What can we do? He said, how can we prevent it? Who wants to prevent Christ from coming? What can I do to change it? God has only given us one thing to do. And that's trust him. 
and have a faith in him that does not doubt. A faith that doesn't look back in Luke 9, 6. A faith that doesn't look back. There's nothing back there. Nothing back there. Everything about my life is out front. And I've got to have the belief that my, the, the blessings of God is in front of me and I cannot live on the blessings of the past. Where does God want me to look? Why do you think he put our eyes on the front of our face? So that we could look forward. So we could know where we were going. I'm looking forward. And I want you to look forward. Don't look back. Do, do I miss the things that we were doing? Do I miss singing in the choir and having choir practice? Yes, I miss them. Do I miss having groups to come in and sing? Yes, I miss them. Do I miss the things that, that we used to do is come together and do I miss them? But always remember this. When God takes something from us, he's always got something better in front of us. So we've got to look for what's better in front of us. Don't look back. Now we cannot be, have a faith that turns back. John spoke of this in John chapter 6, verse 66. When he asked his disciples, he said, Will you turn back too? Many others had turned away and quit following him. He said, will you turn back to him? There's many, many that used to come to church. Let's turn back. I don't know what, whatever reason you, they've turned back. And what they're waiting for, I do not know. But we must be known as people who it's not going to turn back. We're going to keep marching forward. We cannot be of a faith that draws back. Draws back. What we stood for. When we stand against abortion. And against the, <clears throat> the destruction of the family. Don't draw back. We stood for that all my life. I, I've stood for I, Even when I was lost, I didn't think it was right to kill a baby. Even when I was lost, I didn't think it was right for two women to marry and two men to marry. Even when I was lost, I didn't think homosexuality was right. Don't draw back. Jean was reading on Facebook this week about a man who was out by, back behind an abortion clinic and found two little babies. Huh? Five of them. He took those five babies and he buried them. He said they're better than trash. But so many of our brothers and sisters that claim to be brothers and sisters and claim to know Christ have drawn back. I'll tell you what, if you accept abortion, you believe it's all right. I believe what First John says, 219, I believe what he says there. He said they went out with us, but they never was one of us. You said, preacher, that's just that's hard on these people that believe that way. You've got to tell them the truth. You've got, to, you've got to stand in their face and tell them what is the truth. It don't hurt. I had someone call me the other day that I'd been very firm with. I mean, firmest I'd ever been in my life with anyone. 
They called me the other day and told me they appreciated the stand that I took, the battle I fought, and that they loved me and they were praying for me. And then you will have the other on the other side who will try to slap you down. But I say to you, don't draw back. Don't draw back. Why? Why can we not draw back? Why can we not waver? Because of the effect that it has on other people. The effect it would have on our children. People who have quit church and left the Lord in apostasy and walked away from their faith. Older generation. Generation that's fathers and mothers. What do you think their children think of them? How do you think their children look at them? You see, if we waver the least bit, people will pick up on it. And those that are closest to us will pick up the quickest, and that's our children. Through our faith, we're passing it on to our family and to our friends. Passing it on. That's what God's called us to do is to pass on our faith that others might see. Young, young lad was going to have surgery. Very, very sick, serious, serious surgery. Snowed terrible that night. Family couldn't get to the hospital, but the pastor made it to the hospital. And the pastor spoke these words to this young man as having severe surgery. And the young man said, I never forgot what he said. He said, the hand that made you is the hand that holds you. And that is true. So when your faith is challenged, remember the hand that made you is the hand that holds you. Anybody got a word? Thank you so much. Did, you, did I clarify what I was talking about with Cyrus's? I hope I did. If I didn't, you see me later, and we'll try to clarify. We'll try to, because we did. We, I, I would have liked to have had more time to, to dig into it. But, but you go home and dig into it, Lord. Word on anyone's heart before we go.